Okay, um, next up we have Paul McKenney uh, talking about decoding those inscrutable RCU CPU store warnings. Please welcome Paul. Thank you, Andrew. And yes, I assert they are for your own good. Honest. <laughs> so, <laughs> cool. So, uh, we're going to go through a few topics here. Um, first thing, I guess, is that uh, in the common case, RCU actually doesn't emit CPU stall warnings. So this is a simplified situation with the preemption disabled. And what normally happens, you have a couple CPUs, they're acting as RCU readers for a little while and blew up there. Uh, time's going from left to right. And uh, at some point, it notices that CPU 0 is idle. It notices that CPU 1 is in user space. And therefore, it says, great. They've both gone through a quiescent state. Grace period's over. Done. On to the next one. The time we get stall warnings is when something like this happens. And uh, what happens is that CPU 0 is in a reader or doing something that's preventing RCU from progressing for a very long time. In mainline, it's 21 seconds. A number of the distro kernels keep it at 60 seconds. So for the example here is having interrupts disabled. If you have a CPU with interrupts disabled for 21 seconds, I would respectfully suggest you've got a serious problem, let alone if you're doing it for 60 seconds. Um, so in this case, RCU is letting you know that uh, you've got a long-term, rather non-responsive CPU. Uh, of course, in some cases, Linux has a huge number of workloads. Back in the 90s, when I was a sequent, if we ran a certain database vendor's software, that was all there was to it. If it didn't do anything else, it wasn't a problem. If it did something else, it wasn't a big deal. But uh, Linux has a lot of different use cases, and in some cases it might well be legitimate to have interrupts disabled for 21 seconds, or even 60 seconds. And uh, we have to allow for that. And we have a number of, uh, we have some boot parameters and a kconfig parameter that will shut them off. So if you really need to not have these things, if uh, it's warning you about something that is normal operating procedure for your particular use case, that's how you turn it off. Um, if response time matters to you, though, having interrupts disabled on a CPU for tens of seconds is not a good thing. And of course, you might also be suppressing other real errors. But that's a trade-off you make. These are available. You can use them if you feel that the warning is causing you trouble and you're doing something unusual that causes the situation. If you aren't doing that, then you might want to leave them unsuppressed. OK, I'm not going to go through this in great detail. I'm just going to point out a couple of things, and I'll have the slides will be available, and I'm, I'm available as well if you have particular things. If you run into these things that's confusing to you, my email address is readily available. Send it to me. Um, and by the way, if you have questions at any point in the time, yell them out. We'll get a mic to you, and, and uh, we'll get them answered. Okay, that's, uh, there's two ways you can get a stall warning. This is the case where some CPU was off out for a pizza, maybe with interrupts disabled or something bad was happening, and it was incapable of going through any part of RCU. And so some other CPU looked and said, you know, that CPU over there has been stuck for a long time. And in this case, uh, CPU 1 decided CPU 0 had been stuck for a very long time and complained about it. Now, there's a bunch of information in that first three lines. I'm not going to go through it in detail at the moment, um, aside from Looking at uh, the next line, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, the C and the G there, the G and the C there. Um, what can happen sometimes, you may get repeated stalls. So it may give you a stall warning and some period of time later you get another one. If the numbers in the G and the C there remain the same in successive stalls, what's happening is they're complaining over and over about the same event. If they change, that means that it went for 21 seconds, then it went for 25 seconds, got itself back under control, and then later on had some other problem or some similar problem again. Another way you can distinguish those two cases 
is that T there. T equals 2100. This is a 1,000 hertz machine. Hertz equals 1,000 machine. That's 21 seconds. If uh, you saw the next stall saying 21 seconds again, that's clearly a different event. If it instead says 84 seconds or thereabouts, what's happened is that it, this king persisted. So it does 21 seconds the first time, then 63 for the second one, and 63 again. It uses triple the uh, initial timeout for each time it reports again on the problem. And we'll talk about that, uh, some of the advantages of that a little bit later. Uh, you have the standard uh, backtrace start, and usually what you focus on is the stack. In this, case, <clears throat> in this case, the function on top of the stack is RCU torture stall. What that meant is that I told RCU torture, force a stall to happen, and it did. But uh, what you would do normally if, for a stall that was unusual is you take a look at that stack. Oftentimes, by looking in that, you can see some part, see where it is in the kernel and see some part where it may be doing something wrong or, or stuck or stalled for a very long period of time. Okay, <clears throat> this is the case, this is a better case actually. This is the case where the CPU is reporting on itself. And you see this RCU SCED self-detected stall. The thing that's nice about this is the CPU is detecting the stall. That means it can trace its own stack without having to worry about the stack changing while it's tracing it. In the previous case, um, you may have to send NMIs to get the stack trace, and those have their own risks. Or you may be tracing the stack remotely, having one CPU trace another CPU stack while that CPU is still executing. And, uh, uh, that works, but it may be inaccurate. If it detects a stall itself, you, get a little, you can have a little more confidence in what the stack is. And uh, I'm going to skip a bunch of this. Again, we had RCU torture stall was what caused this. I generated this myself by forcing it. The key thing is, is that everything up to the interrupt, so what happened is, is that the CPU was interrupted. It ran some RCU code, and the RCU code said, ooh, this guy, I've been stuck for a long time on the CPU. I'm going to complain, which means that everything up to the first enter up on the stack is just the report itself. You need to look after that in the stack to see what might be causing the problem. In this case, again, RCU torture stall. Um, and I mentioned before that, uh, RCU tor or that, that uh, the RCU CPU stall warnings will recur. If the stall position condition persists for a long time, you'll get multiple stall warning messages. The cool thing about that is you can compare the different stack traces and get some idea. If it's looping through a number of functions, you get some idea of where in the kernel it's going, which allows you to much more easily work out what's happening as opposed to just having one snapshot. You're not sure if the very top of the stack is where the loop's happening, a tight loop in one function, or whether there's loop going up and down through several functions that's covering the thing. Having multiple stack traces helps disambiguate that for you. Okay, so what causes CPU stalls? That's one way to do it. Especially if you have preemptibility, uh, go into RC read lock and uh, stay there for a very long time. In this case, forever. Uh, anybody want to tell me a way to fix that? Yeah, I like that. Don't write it in the first place, yeah. Uh, but if you had something where you need to do a long period of time, uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, There you are, good, good point. Um, and that's, you, you want to break out occasionally. And there's actually a number of places where they'll have a loop, they'll be in a reset critical section, and it'll occasionally go and drop out of the reset critical session after nailing down the element it was referencing at that point, so they won't go away. And then uh, do whatever to let the rest of the system do something and then get back in. Um, and it's uh, nice in the kernel if your loops are finite aside from the one that runs the whole system that you don't want to ever stop. You do the same thing with disabling interrupts, as we mentioned earlier, and it has the same kind of a, a fix. And by the way, if you do this sort of thing, and it happens in the dash RT kernel, um, you can expect some complaints to the real-time guys, in particular Thomas, uh, Thomas Gleichsner. So, you know, uh, when you, when you hit, know he screamed at you, that would be a hint that... And, and the nice thing about the stall warnings is I think they're a little more polite than Thomas is sometimes. But, I guess it depends on your, how you like to look at things. Um, it's also possible to loop with preemption disabled, and in some cases that can cause a stall. 
Uh, bottom half, same deal. Um, if, you have a long run, if you have an RC reader, it's nice and short. Everything's wonderful. But you take an interrupt in the middle of it, and the interrupt goes forever. Um, that can cause the problem as well. Um, if you uh, loop without invoking schedule or doing a con resched, uh, and uh, another thing you can do if you have preemption enabled is just have the reader be preempted for a very long time. Um, and there's a, another kernel parameter that allows priority boosting to get out of that. Um, alternatively, um, if, you, if you really are wanting real-time response, a common practice you, that you'll use is to keep the utilization of the system down to a dull roar, like not 99%. Um, and by having the utilization down, you have plenty of idle periods, and then these sorts of things will, will, the rest of the processing will stop, the reader will get a chance to run again, and life will be fine. Um, this is kind of, last one's kind of a plug for my Thursday presentation. In virtualized environments, your vCPU can be preempted. And uh, uh, Arvind Prasad has been leading that up. We've got a paper in Unix, and we'll talk about that Thursday. This one happens surprisingly often. You know, when, when I was 20 years old, 115K baud was like insanely fast. But you don't have to have a whole lot of output for it to take longer than 21 seconds. And depending on how, what the kernel's doing or whatever's going on, it, uh, you know, it, you know, if you have 500K of output, um, it will take a long time. And in some cases, the, the uh, printf print K system will spin with interrupts disabled, outputting these stupid characters at 115k baud, which means each character takes many microseconds. Um, one of the things that Tejan Hill recently did, I've got this in my queue, um, is uh, to uh, avoid some of the consequences of this by, if you have a huge pile of printfs that you know are there, disabling the stall warnings around them. Um, we're trying this as an experiment. We'll see how it goes. But if you're having this kind of problem, uh, it's one thing to do. Oh, by the way, you don't actually need a slow-speed serial line to cause this to happen. Apparently, there are some large uh, data centers where they emulate the slow serial line by having management uh, structures of some sort or another that uh, throttle the console output. So uh, you can do this with high-speed LANs just by having the software do it for you which is apparently how Tejan got interested in it. Another popular one is to develop on your high-speed x86 laptop and then deploy on a 100 megahertz embedded CPU. What can happen is you can have your thing where you disable interrupts for a little while, and it was only, you know, it wasn't that long on the x86, so it worked fine, and you run on this really slow CPU, and suddenly you've got 21 seconds of interrupts disabled. Um, you can also have a situation where the interrupts are just fine on your fast x86. You run on the slow system, and suddenly the interrupts are just monopolizing the entire CPU because the CPU just can't keep up with interrupts anymore. Um, and so there's a bunch of things kind of like this. The general lesson is if you're going to develop on one system and, and deploy on the other one, you might want to adjust the timeouts or do something to make sure that your getting the same behavior on the fast system in terms of this sort of thing as you would on the slow system. Alternatively, um, get the slow system to where it's running more quick, more sooner in your development process, or perhaps artificially slow down your fast system. There's various power management tricks you can do to crank the clock rate down. Uh, any one of those things to make it happen uh, uh, a little bit better. Uh, I've had uh, several cases where people managed to sh completely shut off the CPU's clock interrupt, um, and that uh, prevent a whole bunch of things from happening, including RCU uh, getting there in time. And one case, only once, what happens is the CPU just fail stopped. It just stopped. And uh, sometime later, RCU complained about the CPU not doing anything. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm, this is interesting, but uh, yeah, I, hope, I suppose that might be more interest. Uh, that's what happens if you. Uh, don't uh, have fast enough response time when you when uh, if, you know when people are doing embedded things. I don't know they're wearing masks kind of, but I'm sure he's in there somewhere. I asked which one was Thomas. Uh, that you can also get this reaction by uh, wasting power for people on battery-powered systems. It uh, kind of looks like this. 
But uh, in any case, uh, the, I'm, I'm going uh, the, the, to what you can hit. What you can hit here is there. You can, one way you can cause this to happen is to make it so that RCU's own K threads don't execute. And you'll see something like that in your D message if you do that. So here we've said that this K thread star for 21,000 jiffies or 21 seconds. Um, and uh, if you don't let my stuff run, it can't do anything for you. In this case, um, what happened is that uh, the, the K thread said, hey, I want to sleep for about three jiffies. And 21 seconds later, it was still sleeping. Um, there's a, there turns out that there's a cluster of bugs involved in this. Uh, I've been getting a lot of help from uh, Anna Maria, Thomas, and Sebastian on this. Uh, but we're still working through it. Uh, it's it's kind of bizarre. Uh, I, my test machine turns out to be much more sensitive to this bug than the other ones. Is that I can make it happen about every three hours of RCU torture. And they run for like 50 or 60 and maybe have it once, happen once or not. So um, it's been an interesting collaboration on that, uh, on that front. <sighs> My favorite uh, war story is CPU zero standard time. Uh, people uh, bringing up new architectures can have this problem. As you can see, the different CPUs have a different idea of what time it is. And that can be surprisingly OK. But if the guys uh, that are ahead in time or behind in time start the grace period, so uh, CPU zero starts, so what do you think is t equals zero? And CPU1 comes along and says, wow, it's T equals 30, and this grace period isn't done yet. Stall, stall, warning, yeah, you know, even though no time has passed. And uh, this really does happen occasionally. So if you're, if you're bringing up a new system, a new, uh, uh, or, or changing your, your clock system or your timing, and you're getting these stall warnings, that might be a hint to check your patches on the, on the timing. And uh, I think we're getting towards the end. Uh, I'm... I'm, uh, I'm not going to go through this one in uh, great detail, but it's uh, uh, entertaining as well, I suppose. Uh, let's just say that there are interesting code sequences in hot plug uh, to avoid uh, RCU and the timers deadlocking each other. So uh, kind of a summary here. Uh, this can be a helpful diagnostic tool, irritating though it can be at times. But on the other hand, that is a property of good diagnostic tools. That's their whole point in life is to irritate you and tell you your code's broken. We've gone through a bunch of reasons that these can, uh, these can happen. We've talked about how you should have pause points and unbounded loops so you can get out of this. Uh, test on deployment class systems or adjust your development system to get the same kind of timing so you don't get surprised. Uh, in the case of uh, the real-time things, assign your priorities carefully or allow idle time or use RCU priority boosting or something like that. And uh, if you're making a new architecture or making new clocks, respect the passage of time. And uh, probably last, but uh, maybe most important, is to make sure this McKinney guy doesn't screw up RCU. Anyway, uh, obligatory slide sponsored by IBM Legal. And I think we've got time for a couple of questions, if people have them. And uh, by the way, if you're running into stall warnings and you don't figure it out, that's a legitimate reason to bug me about it. Um, I'm hoping that uh, it, it, there have been more cases of people just working on them getting them solved, so it's uh, the knowledge is getting out there, which is good. Also, if there are places where it's obscure and the message isn't making sense, let me know, because making the messages better is part of what I do as well. So places I've maybe seen this in production or something where like an NFS server's gone bad, mm -hmm. is that effectively indicating that that area of code will be a candidate for having that breakout if possible, assuming it's not some kind of state it can't otherwise break from? Like, should that be a, a bug, or is it really just too bad in that situation? Uh, it it kind of depends on what's going on. I haven't, I, ha I don't recall right offhand any NFS-related ones, but I have seen VM-related ones, where you end up with a situation, and, and NFS might have this property, that's why I'm mentioning it, where you've got a device, it used to be a disk, where you write and then you block, but now it's an SSD where you can just keep going forever. You got a whole pile of processes that are dirtying memory. And so some poor jerk of a CPU is trying to write the stuff out and it's just never getting catching up. And so it gives a stall warning. Uh, so that's actually easy to deal with. It's easy to fix it. What you do is you, you're having a loop where it's 
and may, this may be happening with NFS as well, that's why I'm bringing it up. The higher speed networks, maybe used to be NFS blocked all the time because it was slow, now maybe not so much with 100 gig of Ethernet, right? Uh, and SSDs on the other end. Um, and in that case, what happens is you'll see this loop where it's going through. And the thing you can, you can often do is find a place in that loop where it would be okay to block. Um, you didn't this time because the other stuff's keeping up with you. And put in, a, uh, in recent kernels, like, like the next one, uh, put a cond resket in. Uh, in the older kernels, cond resket RCU QS. And you send me an email if, uh, uh, on that if you'd like. And the idea is what that does is it tells RCU, hey, this guy really is making progress. You know, it, it, essentially, it essentially puts a point in there where it's uh, without really having to do much aside from have the opportunity of being blocked. Uh, where you can just tell RCU, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay, believe me, I'm okay, even though I'm looping here for a long time, it's all right. So th that's my guess, uh, but the thing I'd look at is the stack traces and see where, it, where it's at. More questions? If not, thank you very much for your time and attention, and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you, Paul.